Amen. The part of the chapter we're going to focus on this morning is found in John chapter 1 and verse number 29, where the Bible reads, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And again, in verse number 36, it says, And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the title of my sermon this morning is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Now, if you would, go with me, if you would, to Re Revelation chapter number 5. Revelation chapter number 5. I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter number 8. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verse number 30, this passage in Acts chapter 8 is a, is a very familiar scripture that we would use uh, in reference to salvation when we're witnessing to someone. It's a great scripture to basically emphasize this matter of just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And we can use this for that. But I want you to notice something in Acts chapter 8, verse number 30 says, And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? Except some man should guide me, and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep before the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shears, so opened he not his mouth. And one thing you'll notice throughout the Bible, that Jesus Christ is always referenced as the Lamb of God. Amen. Okay, look at Revelation chapter number 5, verse number 6. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures in Revelation. The Bible says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne... And of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, capital L, by the way, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints." And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. <clears throat> saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And one interesting thing about Revelation, of course, Jesus Christ is referenced as being, or his name is Jesus. Jesus Christ. And of course, there's a false doctrine out there that's teaching that Jesus in the book of Revelation or in the end times is not going to be called Jesus. His name is going to be called Yeshua, right? And it's interesting because, and they say, well, you know, that's the Greek word for, for, for Jesus. And, and you, uh, you know, you guys got to be able to reference him as, G, as Yeshua in, in, in the New Testament. Well, it's funny because I led a guy who was a Greek to the Lord, okay? And when I led him to the Lord, by the way, previous to that, I actually, I actually witnessed to a Jew and he rejected it. But then the Greek got saved. Amen. Yeah. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. But the Greek's actually the one who actually got saved. Amen. Yeah. But I witnessed to this guy and I said, I have a question for you. I said, do you have a Bible? And he says, yes, I have a Bible. It's in my language. He had the, 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 the Texas Receptus, New Testament. And then I said, how do you say Jesus in Greek? And he said, Isus. I said, you don't say Yeshua? He goes, No. <laughs> He said, it's Isus. Now, he had a thick accent. He says, Isus. I said, so nowhere is like Yeshua found in the... He's like, no. He said, Isus. <laughs> like, I said, I don't believe it's Yeshua. I'm just asking. I said, because I've heard people say that. And he goes, no, no, no. It's Isus, he said. Now, but one interesting thing to note in the book of Revelation is that he's actually referenced, not as a name, but he's referenced as the Lamb. More times than he would be called Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the Lamb of God who should take away the sins of the world. Now go to Revelation chapter number 7. Revelation chapter number 7, verse number 9. The Bible says, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. By the way, this is referencing the rapture. Amen. Okay? Amen. And stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Go to verse number 13. 
And one of the elders uh, answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Where did they come from? I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Go to Revelation chapter number 12. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12. So we see over and over again, Jesus Christ is referenced to being the Lamb. Verse number 11, the Bible says, And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read to you from Revelation chapter 13, and verse 8, where the Bible reads, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of of the world. And again in Revelation 14, verse 1, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. So it goes without saying, Jesus Christ is the Lamb. Amen. Amen. And it's a wonderful thing. And if you're to ask, and if I were to ask any one of you, or if you were to ask anyone who has any knowledge in regards to what this is talking about, you would say, Yeah, Jesus Christ is the Lamb because he came to take away the sins of the world. Amen. He's a fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrifices. And amen to that. But there's so much that goes into that concept right there and that doctrine. You see, as we read, as we read in John chapter 1, he's referred to the lamb because, yes, he took away the sins of the world. And just as the lambs, the bullocks, and the, the rams of the Old Testament were sacrificed, that's what Jesus Christ, he was the direct fulfillment of those sacrifices in the Old Testament. Now, let me say this, is that, you know, those who worship the creature more than the creator hate the fact that the lambs and bullocks and rams are sacrificed in the Old Testament, okay? You're like, why did God have to kill all these animals? Well, simply because the animals are not here to just, like, be worshipped. Right. They're here for us, yeah. all right? And to eat, and by the way, and for this specific, specific scripture, they're there to picture what Jesus Christ was going to do. Amen. Now, there's a false doctrine out there called dispensationalism, okay? Amen. And I hate dispensationalism. Amen. I will always hate it. It will always be rejected Amen. in this church. Amen. But dispensationalism teaches that people were saved by works in the Old Testament. And they were saved by grace in the New Testament, but one day it's going to go by, by, be by works once again. Well, what they're referring to is the sacrifices being, the lambs being sacrificed in the Old Testament. They say, that's how people were saved. And they'll pull out scriptures how they made an atonement for the, for the sins of the people through these sacrifices. Well, these people obviously are not reading the entire Bible. Yeah. Okay? Because you can't just take all your doctrines from Old Testament scriptures and base your foundation off of those scriptures. Yeah. You know, you got to read the entire thing. Obviously, they didn't read Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 9, where the Bible says that these things were a shadow of things to come. Well, what is a shadow? It's not the direct image of what you're looking at. It's a, it's a shadow of it. Okay, my shadow is right, it's somewhere around here. It's below me, all right? My shadow is not me. Okay, it's a shadow of the actual image, which is me. And the Bible says that the sacrifices of the Old Testament were a shadow of these things. No, no, no. no they had to sacrifice in order to be saved. They had to keep the commandments. Well, you know, the Bible says that it is not possible. Not possible. Amen. Let me explain what that means. That means impossible. Amen. In case you didn't know what that meant. Not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Amen. So dispensationalists, or what I like to call them dipsticks, you need to read Hebrews chapter 10 where it says it's not possible. Okay? That was a shadow of things to come. Now, we will say this is that the fact that they were shed, the blood was shed, that was a picture of what Jesus Christ was going to do. Why? Because the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Remission means pardon, means forgiveness. And so they were looking forward to what Christ was going to do. Of course, we look back to what Christ did. Why? Because he shed his blood, and because of that, we receive remissions of sins. It's a beautiful picture of that. Now, go to Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. <clears throat> but they like to hold on to this thing where it's just like, you know, well, they have to do the sacrifices. You know, Jesus Christ, once he was crucified, he sacrificed once and for all, the Bible says. Yes. Right. Okay? And, and that's for the Old Testament. That's for New Testament. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 7 says, But in the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. 
while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. And look what it says, that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So it even says it right there. When those priests would go in there and they would offer the sacrifices, they couldn't make them perfect. Okay? It was impossible for those sacrifices to impute righteousness unto those priests and unto the people. Why? Because they were a shadow of things to come. It was a picture. Now go to Genesis chapter 22. You see, the sacrifices, it is a beautiful... Now, I'm, to be there, I mean, how many of you have ever seen an animal be killed live? Okay? Pretty gruesome. I remember, I remember to Guatemala, my, my, um, my aunt, she had prepared swine, a, a big uh, pig for us to eat. And uh, he was nice and fat and just like ready. I mean, they kept him like in that stall so he wouldn't move around or anything like that. So he's just building up that fat and he's just, well, when we came, I mean, she hired these butchers and stuff like that. And it was gruesome. I mean, I remember they, they tied a rope around his neck and they brought him out. They grabbed the axe and with the butt of the axe, they just whacked him across the head. And he just, <laughs> all he hears is just like screaming. And, but he didn't knock out, you know, so they had to hit him again and he fell over. Then they came, they grabbed the knife and they stuck it in his throat and there's just blood just all over. And I'm like, I'm like, I just go to the drive through <laughs> and just order my food. I don't see all this going on, you know. But I saw the entire process. It's a very gruesome thing to behold. But this is something that was done yearly in Israel with the sacrifices. Okay. And, and here's the thing. There's no nice way to kill an animal. <laughs> right. You know, you say, well, you, they could have done it in a better way. You know, OK. I remember one time my, my aunt, my other aunt. Oh, my aunts are kind of weird now that I think about how they do these things. You know, she when I was like eight years old, she brought me to the window and she was about to make um, caldo. You guys know what caldo is? Okay, all the Hispanics do. It's soup. Chicken soup is what it is. But with like real chicken, you know, and and she actually she grabbed the chicken and uh, I didn't know she had the chicken, but she, she's like, Bruce, come here, come to the window. And I'm like, yeah, I walk over there and she she has the chicken by the neck and she grabs the knife and just goes. And I'm like, <laughs> You know, all this blood is going, and the, the, the body falls, and it's like trying to run. It was traumatizing, to be honest with you. But you know what? There's no good way to kill even a chicken, okay? But you know what? These sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were very gruesome. If you read Leviticus, you read the process of how they did this. It was a very gruesome process. But you know what? It was to picture the gruesome death of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And, 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 and it goes to show what we deserve, right? For our sins, what we deserve to pay because of our sins. Now, obviously, the, the, the instructions of the sacrifices were instituted in the Levitical law when Moses came. But sacrifices were done even long, long before that. Okay, and in fact, look at Genesis 22, verse 7 says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now, the immediate thing that Abraham was talking about was the fact that he knew that God was not going to allow him to literally sacrifice his own son. He had faith, or even if he did sacrifice, he had faith that he would bring him back to life, right? But you see, even after the story, there is a ram caught in the thicket, and they used that to burn a sacrifice. He understood that God would provide himself a sacrifice, but the secondary application there is a prophecy of what was going to take place in the future. Why? Because God will provide himself a sacrifice, right? Yeah. Through Jesus Christ. And so this is something that was told even in the Old Testament. Now go, go to Genesis chapter number three. Genesis chapter number three. Today we're going to look at just the similarities between Jesus Christ and the Lamb. And I think just as I preached this sermon, as I read this, it just gave me a greater appreciation for my salvation. It gave me a greater appreciation for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. First and foremost, what is the first similarity that we see in the Bible? Well, he provided a covering. Okay. Jesus Christ provided a covering. Look at verse number 18. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Now, if you remember in the beginning of Genesis chapter number three, 
Adam and Eve sin, and what happens? They sewed fig leaves together, okay? And this is a picture of someone trying to work their way to heaven, okay? To try to cover up their sins by sewing aprons together. And as we mentioned before, an apron just covers the front. It doesn't cover the back, okay? And the back parts is what the Bible calls nakedness. So you may be able to fool people from the front, but you won't fool them as soon as you turn around, okay? With your fig leaves, aprons, okay? So what did God say? No, 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 that's not going to work. We, you need coats of skin. And that leads to show that he sacrificed an animal to make those coats of skin. Amen. And that's a beautiful picture of what Jesus Christ did. Why? Because before Christ, we were, of course, the Bible says that there's none that doeth good. No, not one. But what happened? When we got saved, God covered us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay? We were no longer naked before the Lord. Our sins were no longer there. What happened? The Bible says that our sins were separated as, east, as far as east is from west. Now go to Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64. See, it was necessary for a lamb to be sacrificed in order to, to provide covering for Adam and Eve. And you know what? The same goes for us. It's necessary that Jesus Christ had to be crucified, had to go to hell for three days and three nights, had to resurrect in order to provide a covering for us Amen. as well. Look at Isaiah 64, verse number 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us Away. So we see here that the correlation, the filthy rags is, is, is uh, synonymous with the, with the fading of the leaf. Just like the leaves that Adam and Eve had, they just fade. They're not going to last forever. The Bible says here that our righteousness before Christ were as filthy rags. There were as leaves fading, the Bible says. And what happens when it fades? It's no longer there and our nakedness is shown. Okay. Go to, Job, uh, excuse me, go to Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3. I'm going to read to you from Job 31, verse 33, where the Bible says, If I covered my transgression as Adam by hiding mine iniquity in my bosom. You know what we have today? We have a lot of people, unbelievers, who are simply hiding their sin by their own righteousness. Okay, Whether it's their works, they're, they're using the fact that they're going to church, that they read the Bible, that they you know, pray to Hail Mary. They did all these righteous works, supposedly. But you know what the Bible says? Their righteousness are as filthy rags. And not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, the Bible says. You know, yesterday when we went out soul winning, I was privileged to lead three people to the Lord yesterday. And two of those people uh, was a daughter and a mother. And when I, when I was speaking to them and, and they got saved, you, you know, I, I talked to the girl and, and the daughter, her name was Liz. And she basically, she, she basically said this. She, just, she said, you're right. I am trusting in myself to be saved. Because when I asked her, I said, what do you have to do to get to heaven? Or, or why do you think you're going to heaven? She said, because I'm a good person, you know, and I do good things. And, and I believe that, you know, um, I, I believe that I, I do good things and good works. And therefore, I should be allowed into heaven because I, I think I'm, I'm a good person. Well, after I showed her all the scriptures, I said, you know, I gave her the definition of what believing means, means to trust, right, in Jesus Christ. I said, now, why does God say that we have to trust in Jesus Christ to be saved? Because you're trusting in yourself. And if you're trusting in yourself, you're not really trusting in Jesus Christ. She laughed and she said, well, you're right. I am trusting in myself. You know, because I felt like I can keep the commandments. I'm a good person. But the, but the Bible clearly shows I can't trust in myself. I need to trust in Christ. And she got saved. Amen. But you know what? There's a lot of people out there that are still trusting in themselves. They need the covering, the righteousness. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. The Bible says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What happens when we get saved? We put on Christ. Go to Romans chapter number 4. Romans chapter number 4. I'm going to read to you from Isaiah chapter 61, verse number 10, where the Bible reads, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of righteousness. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Excuse me, garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Romans chapter 4 and verse number 5. This is a great chapter to use in your gospel presentation here. Look what the Bible says in verse number five, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are what? Covered. 
Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's a wonderful thing to know that when we got saved, our sins were covered. Amen. And just as God covered Adam and Eve with the coats of skin, the Bible teaches us that when we got saved, we were clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our sins are covered. They're forgiven. They will never be exposed ever again. You know, there's a teaching that says, well, you know, one day God is going to show you all your sins on a panoramic screen. L, uh, what do they call it? The LDS screen or something like that. And he's going to show all the things that you've done. He's going to shame you before everyone. Lying. That's a, they, they will never be shown. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. From the book of life, they've all been torn out. I don't remember them anymore. Praise the Lord for that. Okay. Now, obviously, we're going to get judged according to our works for rewards. Right. Whether they be good or whether they be bad, the Bible says. But our sins will never be remembered ever again. They will never be shown to our face. Why? Because when God looks at us, He sees us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He does not see us through our own righteousness. Now go with me, if you would, to Psalms 85. Psalms 85. So we see here that the similarity between Christ and the Lamb is the fact that He provided a covering. Just as the lamb that was slain for Adam and Eve provided an actual physical covering, he provides the spiritual covering. Psalms 85 and verse number 2, the Bible reads, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. And by the way, the Bible teaches us that if we believe on Christ, we have everlasting life. If we choose not to believe, we shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him, right? So what happens when we get saved? We have everlasting life. The Bible says that the wrath of God is turned from us. We will no longer suffer the wrath of God, specifically talking about hell. Now go to Exodus chapter number 12. That's an awesome picture right there. And I'm thankful that I'm clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, just as the lamb did in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 3, Jesus Christ has covered us with his righteousness. But not only that, but Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ covered, provided a covering, but he was also without blemish. Okay, look at Exodus chapter 12. In verse number 3, the Bible says here, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, uh, let him and his neighbor next unto him, or next unto his house, take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the sheep goats. Now go to Malachi chapter number one. So here we see that God says, uh, the Lord is instructing Israel and says, look, get a lamb and you guys can share, but here's the requirement. It needs to be without blemish. Amen. Okay, now what is a blemish? A blemish is basically an imperfection. Okay, you cannot bring a handicapped lamb. Yeah. Okay, well, that's mean, man. What, you know, what if, you know, GMOs and that person, you know, steroids, and no blemish. Amen. Okay, now here's the thing. You say, well, you know, why is it that Christ, the Lord didn't accept, you know, maybe an imperfect lamb? Because you got to remember, it was picturing what Christ did. Amen. And let me say this. Any time the symbolism in the Old Testament was defiled, God was ticked off. Amen. I mean, if you don't believe that, read about Moses. And how he smote the rock when God said just to speak unto it. Yeah. And he said, you're not even going to go into the promised land. You're going to die right here. Yeah. And by the way, Moses, meekest man that ever lived, he was, I would consider him to be a friend of God. Amen. He had God's favor. He had God's power. He had a good relationship with the Lord. Yet God even executed uh, punishment upon him. Why? Because he defiled the symbolism of the Old Testament of what Christ was going to do for us in the New Testament. It was very important. Yeah, right. Even to the point that he allowed him to die. Him and Aaron to die. Before they reach the promised lamb. And so this is very important. That's why he said, look, a lamb without blemish. Why? Because this is picturing what my son's going to do in the future. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now look at Malachi chapter 1 and verse number 6. The Bible says, a son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? And that, we, and that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? So here we see that these people were guilty 
of bringing like their worst animals and keeping the best for themselves, right? They're the ones that are bringing in the, the lambs with blemishes. They were lame. The Bible says they were blind. Maybe they're like missing an eye or something like that. Like just give, you know, the, the refuse unto the Lord. We'll keep the best, right? And by the way, this, this reminds me of pastors today, okay, where they want Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, without blemish. They want the right type of salvation, but they could care less of what the congregation gets. They don't care if the, pe if the people believe in a, in a lamb of blemish, right? Or you have to repent of your sins or do some sort of work. And they say, they're just a little off. Yeah, but you believe the right salvation. You want the lamb without blemish. Yeah, you're allowing your congregants to believe on a lamb that has blemishes, that's lame, that's not Christ at all. Okay? And that's wicked. No, if it's good enough for us, it's good enough for everyone else. Okay? And God requires a lamb without blemish. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And the Bible says that's evil. It was an evil thing to do. But this is a wonderful picture because Jesus Christ what, was and is perfect. Okay? He is without blemish. Look what the Bible says in verse number 18 of 1 Peter chapter number 1. For as much as ye know, uh, Brother David, thank you. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. You see, Jesus Christ is the only one who kept every single commandment in the Bible. Amen. Okay? He was perfect. He was with, without spot, without blemish. And in fact, even when he was arrested and came before Pilate, Pilate said of him, I find no fault in him. Yep, right. Okay. And the Bible would say that what they testified against Christ, they agreed not to. They, they, their their, their, their uh, testimonies didn't even agree with one another. Why? Because they had to lie about him. Okay. He was without uh, reproach. The Bible says that he was without blemish and without spot. Go to Hebrews chapter number four. Now, what do we mean that he was without blemish and without spot? Look what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 14. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the healings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, look what it says, yet without sin. So why was he without blemish? Why was he without spot? Because he was without sin. Amen. Okay. I remember one time we went, uh, uh, when I was out soul winning, we were in a heavily, heavy, heavy Catholic area. And uh, I love witnessing to Catholics, but I specifically like witnessing, witnessing to the backslidden Catholics. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the ones who really don't go to church or whatever, you know, because you can win them over a, a, a lot easier. But this place was like, these people went to mass. Okay. <laughs> And um, I remember I talked to this one, or, or excuse me, I was with another guy, and he was witnessing to this man, and he's like, look, I believe in the Virgin Mary. You know, that's like their famous go-to card, right? Virgin Mary, you know? And um, he, my friend, he showed him the scriptures where, you know, she, even she needed a savior, you know, where he kind of like, like corrected his own mother, right? He was showing her these, he was showing this guy the scriptures, and he said, and he said, do you think like Jesus Christ was wrong? And obviously it was like a rhetorical question. He wasn't expecting him to answer this. He goes, do you think Jesus Christ, you think he sinned by, by re reprimanding his mom? He's like, yeah, he was wrong for that. He's a, he sinned. I freaked out. I never heard anybody say that in my life. And he's like, because that's the Virgin Mary, you know. And he sinned. He should not. He should not have done that. I mean, I, that guy's reprobate, <laughs> in my opinion. Now, you know what I mean. When you say that Jesus Christ sinned and he did wrong, I mean, I've run into some pretty staunch Catholics, and they won't even tiptoe around that. They won't even go near that. Yeah, I mean, they they would just plainly take the correction and say, Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, he he did correct. You know, because because Catholics they they'll say they believe the Bible. And they actually, if you show them from the Word of God, they, they'll actually believe. I'm talking about the, the, the ones who are, who are sincere, okay? Yeah. Not the ones who just want to be deceived, okay? But this person said that. And no, that guy's wrong. He was without sin. Amen. There's no sin found in him. Go to Leviticus chapter number 1. <coughs> Leviticus chapter number 1. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter number 1, in verse number 1, the Lord called unto Moses... 
Leviticus chapter 1 and verse number 1, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Uh, skip down to verse number 10. And if his offering be of the flocks, namely of the sheep or of the goats, for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring a male without blemish. And by the way, I like what it says, his own voluntary will. I believe that's a picture of Jesus Christ. Thank you. I believe that's a picture of Jesus Christ who he gave himself voluntarily. Right? right? He chose to sacrifice himself for us. Now obviously the Father sent him, but he chose out of his own will to give himself a ransom for many. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 17. Deuteronomy chapter number 17. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter number 17. In verse number 1, the Bible says, Thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God any bullock or sheep wherein is blemish or any evil favoredness. For that is an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So he even says, no evil favoredness. No thing that you can look at and say there's a blemish, there's a spot, there's a wrinkle, there's something wrong with this sacrifice. No, no evil favoredness. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 2.22, Who did no sin, neither was found, uh, excuse me, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin shall live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Now go to 1 John chapter number 3. So we see that the similarities between the Lord and the Lamb of the Old Testament is that obviously he provided a covering. But not only that, he was without blemish. He had no sin. He was, he was perfect. 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 5 says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Now it's interesting that these modalists, right, they want to act like they're defending the deity of Jesus Christ, right? But when you probe them more and more, eventually it comes out that they're taken away from the deity of Jesus Christ. To the point where he just becomes just a regular man with no divinity. And here's the thing. The reason this is dangerous as far as modalism is concerned is because it tricks people into thinking, oh, these guys are revering. They're just uplifting the divinity of Christ. No, they're not. They're taking it away. Yeah. Yeah. They give it to take it away. Okay? No, he was a man who had no sin, the Bible says. Now go, to, uh, go with me, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 16. Now the first thing that makes modalism suspect to me is the fact that it comes from Pentecostals. <laughs> I mean, just that alone should, should raise a red flag to say, okay, there's something wrong with this. <laughs> this comes from the tongue-flapping weirdos. We probably shouldn't adhere to this, this doctrine that's being, that's being understood here. Okay? Now look, as far as I know, I've been a Christian for 11 years, and I've been an independent Baptist church, uh, independent Baptist for 11 years. I've never heard this before. I have aunts and uncles who would believe in this stuff, but we just disregard them as being right because they were Pentecostals to begin with. Yeah. And look, Pentecostals believe that you can lose your salvation. Mm -hmm. So that means, guess what? They're not saved. Yeah. Right. right? So if an unsaved person is trying to explain the intricacies of the Trinity, <laughs> that's a wrong person to get your theology from. Yeah. Why? Because the Bible says that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. Okay? They're, what are they going to do? They're going to pervert the teachings. Okay? They're going to add their own twist to it, the devil's twist to it. Now, as we mentioned, the, Jesus Christ was a, good picture, it was a great picture of the Lamb. Why? Because he provided a covering, a righteousness. But not only that, but he was without blemish, he was without spot. But here's one of my favorite things about this matter of picturing uh, the Lamb, is that he was our scapegoat. Okay. Now the word scapegoat is only found once in the Bible, multiple times, but in one specific scripture, chapter, that's in Leviticus chapter 16. Now this is great. As I begin to study this, I mean, it just, it just reinforced a lot of my personal beliefs in regards to what we're going to look at. But before we read Leviticus 16, I'm going to read to you from, from uh, the, the, the writings of Ellen G. White. Okay. Don't stone me yet. I'm not for what she's saying here. This lady is... Obviously, she's burning in hell today, Amen. okay? Yeah. But she is the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist, mm -hmm. okay? 
Now, I didn't know this until someone mentioned this, what they believe regarding the scapegoat. How many of you, have you ever heard what they believe about the scapegoat? It's a very strange doctrine. It says here, the identification and eschatological meaning of a scapegoat of Levit Leviticus 16 has generated much discussion in academic circles. Here's problem number one. Within Jewish tradition, <laughs> by the way, it goes like this. It goes, if you're Pentecostal, mm -hmm. don't follow it. If it goes Jewish, really don't follow yeah. it, okay? <laughs> The scapegoat was always seen as a demonic being. But since the post-apostolic period, many Christians' expositors have tried to identify it with Christ and his sacrificial death. Seventh-day Adventists have stressed a clear distinction between the goats, considering the one for the Lord as a type of Christ and the one for the scapegoat as representing Satan. This is also the view expressed in Ellen White's writing. So what they're saying is, we're going to read Leviticus in, in just a moment. But in Leviticus chapter 16, God gives the instruction to Aaron to sacrifice, or excuse me, to bring two lambs, right? Two goats. They grab two lots and basically they cast them before the goats. One of them is sacrificed as a burnt offering. The other one is they lay their hands on, on that goat and symbolically the sins of the people come upon that goat. Then by a fit man, they take him into the wilderness and they let him go. And we're going to explain why is that in just a moment. But they're saying that the one, the scapegoat, the one who they lay the sins on, that's actually Satan. Now, here's the interesting thing about this doctrine, this false doctrine, is that most false doctrines always have, they always have to relate Jesus Christ to Satan somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Mormons do that. Yeah. The Jehovah's Witnesses do that. And so do the Seventh-day Adventists. They have this obsession with making Jesus Christ the devil. And that's wicked. And I don't even, I mean, just by reading that, I, didn't, I, I mean, Leviticus 16, I don't know how you get, oh yeah, that's definitely Satan right there. And by the way, if you read it NIV, that'll make perfect sense to you. Right? Because they always try, they, they flip around the terms and stuff like that to make Jesus Christ look as he is Satan himself. Right? Now go to Leviticus 16, verse number 4. The Bible says here in verse number four, he shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with the linen girdle and with the linen uh, miter shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids. This is not referring to children, by the way, okay? <laughs> two kids are the calves of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the, uh, the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So what is it saying? Lots was basically a system by which they would determine a specific outcome, okay? If they didn't know exactly what to do, they would simply cast lots. You have two goats, which one should we sacrifice? Well, let's cast lots, and whoever the lot falls in that says offering, then that's the one we're going to do for the offering. That's basically what it was. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Skip down to verse number 20. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Skip down to verse 24. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place, and put on his garments, and come forth, and offer his burnt offering, and the burnt offering of the people, and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar, and he that let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in the water and afterward come into the camp. So here we see this large process taking place of what they do with both goats. Now, why is Jesus Christ the scapegoat? Okay, well, simply for the fact, obviously, if you read in Matthew 27, 
when Jesus Christ was crucified, he cries out, Eli, Eli, Lamex Sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we understand when Christ was crucified, the sins of the whole world, he bore them on himself. And he became sin for us, the Bible says, okay? Who knew no sin. The Bible, I, I'm going to quote it to you. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, Jesus Christ didn't sin. Right. All these sins that, were, that he bore himself, he didn't commit any of them. Yeah. Just like the goat was not at fault for all the iniquities of the people, but guess what? They were blamed. Scapegoat simply means a person who's blamed for something that they didn't, did not do, right? Now, here's the thing, and this is a wonderful picture here, because in Leviticus 16, you see that one offering was given for a what? Burn offering. What is that picture? Jesus Christ dying and going to hell. But here's the thing. He ascended, but what is it that he first descended into lower parts of the earth, the Bible says. But we obviously know that he told the, 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 the thief, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. What did he say? In the, in, into thy hands I, com I commend my spirit, right? So not only did he go to hell, but just as the scapegoat was given to the alive before the Lord, that was a fulfillment as well. Because when Jesus Christ went to hell, he also was in heaven, alive before the Lord. Why? Because anybody who's in heaven is alive, obviously, right? Yeah. So what is it? What is it? It's a picture of both, okay? The scapegoat pictures the fact that he was in heaven as well. Why? Because he is God himself, right? And so it, the burnt offering pictures the fact that he went to hell for three days and three nights. The scapegoat pictures the fact that the blame was placed on him, but he was alive before the Lord. It's a wonderful picture of both. It doesn't picture the fact that he's Satan or that he's a devil, no, it pictures the fact that he bore our sins upon himself, even though he committed no sin, and that he was alive before the Lord, right? Now, go with me, if you would, to, uh, let's see, go with me, if you would, to, where's the scripture I had here? Go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 27. For sake of time, we're not going to read this entire, you could just write it down. I'm going to explain This is the story of Barabbas, Okay. Now, this is a great picture of what, took, what takes place in Leviticus 16. Why is that? Because in Matthew, excuse me, yes, in Matthew 27, we see a man by the name of Barabbas. And who was released for the people? Barabbas was. Well, the Bible says that Barabbas was, was guilty of committing insurrection. He was a murderer. And Luke, the Bible says that he was, he was guilty of sedition and murder. And John, it says that he was guilty of robbery. So this guy was a really bad guy. And Matthew 27 says that he was a notable prisoner. So people knew, yeah, this, I know who this guy is. He committed all these crimes. Yet who was released? Barabbas was. Who was punished for the robbery? Who was punished for the murder, for the sedition, insurrection? Jesus Christ was. You know? So they placed the blame on Christ and they allowed Barabbas to go free. Okay? Which is picture of what? The scapegoat. Okay, which is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. The Bible says, Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. You know who, who was worthy of being crucified? It was Barabbas. Not Jesus. But because he's the scapegoat, the blame went on him, and he suffered that consequences for the sins of the whole world. Right? Go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53. A wonderful picture of the scapegoat is the fact that Jesus Christ took our blame, but he was also alive before the Lord. <clears throat> now we're going to mention the fact that Jesus Christ went to hell for three days and three nights in just a bit, because that's also a picture of what the lamb did, right? The lamb was burnt. But Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before the shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Just as the scapegoat was released into the wilderness, right? Land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. 
Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteousness, my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So this is a beautiful scripture of the fact that he was the scapegoat. Excuse me, scapegoat. He bore the sins of many. Go to Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9, we're reaching from Romans 15, verse 3, says, For when even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Look at Hebrews 9, verse 27 says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered, uh, was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So we see here, what are the similarities of the Lamb of, in Christ? He provided a covering. He was without blemish. He was our scapegoat. He took the blame for us. Now go with me if you went to Exodus chapter number 12. We'll briefly go through this point. But it's worth mentioning. He shed his blood. Which, which is what? An atonement. Okay. Exodus chapter 12, verse number 3. Now, when I was in Bible college. No rocks. <laughs> tomatoes, okay. When I was in Bible college, I was taught falsely that salvation in Exodus was actually when they parted the Red Sea and they went through on dry, land, uh, on dry ground. That's what we were taught. Okay. We were taught. And the reason why is because... There's a verse within that scripture that says, Behold the salvation of the Lord. Okay? But looking at it in context, obviously he's referring to the salvation of their physical bodies. Okay? The salvation of the Lord, the, the sea opens up, they're able to cross through safely. Salvation is in Exodus. Okay? The picture of it, but it's in Exodus chapter 12, verse number 3. Well, the Bible says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take them of every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his, his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and he shall take it out of the sheep or from the, or, or from the goats. Go to verse number 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. And will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Both man and beast against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Man, that's, that's awesome. So basically, all he had to do was see the blood and the judgment would pass over them. They wouldn't suffer the consequences. Okay? If the blood was not there, the angel would destroy them, okay? And that is a picture of, salva uh, of salvation right there. Why? Because when, when the Lord sees the blood, there's a song we sing, right? How does it go? When, the, no, 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 there's another one. When I see the blood? When I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. I don't remember how the tune goes, right? Maybe we sing it tonight. It's a great song to picture salvation, Okay, it's simply when you pass, when God sees the blood of the lambs. Now, obviously, look, that wasn't the blood, that wasn't the blood of Christ, but it was a shadow Amen. of what was taking place. Okay, look at verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out <clears throat> at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through the, uh, to smite the Egyptians. When he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Now go to Hebrews chapter number 8. I know we're using a lot of scripture, but amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 10. Wonderful picture, but again, it's a shadow. Look at verse number one says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? 
because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. Paul's telling the dispensationalists here, Amen. look, if, if they have to be saved through the sacrifices, why do they keep doing it every year? Yeah, right. If the sacrifices could save you, you would only have to do it once. Yeah. Because then they would have no more conscience of sins, the Bible says. Right. Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So it's, it's to remember, he said. Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Now, go back to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to spend the remainder of, of, of the sermon there in Exodus chapter 12. So he provided a covering. He was without blemish. He was the scapegoat. Okay, But not only that. He made an atonement with his blood, but also he offered his flesh to be eaten. Yeah. Okay. Now, the Catholics will hold to this weird doctrine. Yeah. I used to be Catholic, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? Where when you take communion, the wafer, <laughs> that it turns into the literal flesh of Christ. That's called cannibalism. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's weird. I don't know how they even... Got, and they use John chapter 6 to try to prove their point. Okay? Now, we'll, we'll look at that in just a bit. But Exodus chapter 12, in verse number 6, the Bible says here, And ye shall keep it unto the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house, wherein ye shall eat it. So obviously the sacrifices of the Old Testament, by the way, amen, amen. you can eat it, right? Yeah, yeah. God was for eating meat. Amen. In fact, it pictures salvation, amen? amen? When we eat the meat, it's picturing what Christ did for us. Why? Because he gave his body for us. Amen. Okay, now go to John chapter 6. Hold your place there in Exodus chapter 12. Go to John chapter number 6. Now this weird doctrine is called, I think it's called transubstantiation, right? Yeah, yeah. They even got a weird name for it. How many syllables are in that one? One word. Good night. And basically what it means is that that wafer literally transforms into flesh. As soon as, and by the way, it's for their salvation as well. Okay? But they, have, but they do it every single Sunday. Right? John chapter 6, verse 53 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Barely, barely, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me, the Bible says. Now, obviously, if you read the entire chapter, he's also talking about the manna. Why? Because he's the bread of life as well. But it also pictures... The, this fact of eat, this matter of eating the sacrifices, because he's talking about his flesh. Now, it doesn't talk about eating his literal flesh. Okay? By the way, that's a whole lot of meat to go around. You understand that? Yeah. If, we're, if the Catholic churches all around the world are eating the flesh of Christ, I mean, he would have been gone a long time ago. <laughs> that's a lot of flesh to go around. No, this is a picture. This is, he's signifying what the sacrifices were in the Old Testament. When they would sacrifice the lamb, they would burn it, and they would cook it, they would eat it, right? They would eat it. It was, it was a picture. They were foreshadowing to say, one day Christ would give his body for us, okay? He will sacrifice his own body for us, and this is a reminder of us that one day he will do that for us, okay? Now go, to, go back to Exodus chapter number 12. I'm out of time, but we're just going to go over these last points. This is the last point right here. So he provided a covering. He was without blemish. He was a scapegoat. He shed his blood. He gave of his flesh. And lastly, he was a burnt offering. Amen. What does that mean? When Jesus Christ died, the Bible says that he went to hell for three days and three nights. The Exodus chapter 12, verse number 8 says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night and roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. That means everything else, everything in it. And he shall uh, let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Now go to Acts chapter number two. Now I'm going to be a little transparent with you today, okay? I think I'm transparent with you every Sunday, but more so today. 
Um, this was a doctrine that I did not accept until recently, within the last couple years. And I remember even when, when like Alex was at our church, and he, I'm like, man, that just sounds weird to me. And the reason why is because I had to filter through a lot of false doctrine that I've been taught. Okay? There's a lot of conditioning of false doctrine that I was taught throughout the years. And, even, and here's the thing. The reason I believe I came to the conclusion that this is correct was because I had the foundation that I was King James only. Amen. I think that is essential to believing a lot of these doctrines. Right. Why? Because these doctrines can only be found within the King James Bible. He right. said, well, hold on a second. If you're always King James... Why didn't you believe this doctrine if this doctrine was in the King James Bible? Because I would read books written by people that were not using the King James Bible. Okay? And that's my fault. I mean, I made a mistake. I was wrong. And that was my fault. Okay? Now, it came to the point where I had to study it out only using the King James Bible. And let me say this. If anyone has to prove a doctrine using anything else other than the King James Bible, it's a false doctrine. Amen. Okay, and if they have to use anything, any other language, any other books, any other Bibles, if they have to go back to the Greek or the Hebrew, they're wrong. Amen. If you can't prove it using the King James Bible, it's not there. Amen. Okay, oh, you know, uh, yeah, but in the older versions of, no, don't give me that. Right. If you're King James only, stick to the King James Bible. Amen. Right. And by the way, I don't know if you notice, we're a King James only church. So if you come here and you say you're King James only, but you're trying to teach some sort of doctrine that does not use the King James Bible, then guess what? You're not King James only. Right. King James only means this. You're King James only. <laughs> Pretty profound, isn't it? That means, let me just put, turn it around for you. You only use the King James Bible. Can someone help me out? Can we reward that a different way to explain that? You know, and by the way, this is the funny thing about this, okay? Because most people who don't use, uh, who is supposedly a King James only, and they're proving, they're trying to prove some doctrine that doesn't use the King James, they always, they're always directionally, like, handicapped. Okay? Because, you know, we'll talk about the pre-tribulation doctrine, right? And I remember, like, recently, a couple, or a month ago, Pastor Anderson emailed me. He said, hey, here's some doctrine, uh, uh, documentaries that I want you to work on. He goes, one of them is called The Great Fallen Away. He goes, you should do a documentary on The Great Fallen Away. And he put in parentheses, weird pre-trib teaching. I was like, weird, but what is that? Well, I looked into it a little bit. I didn't really look into it a lot until I had a conversation with someone who believed that weird stuff. Where they literally believe that The Great Fallen Away in Thessalonians is referring to the rapture. Like you're falling up. But here's the thing. They can't use the King James Bible to prove that. You have to use some modern stupid version of the Bible to prove that. You don't fall up. You say, why, why do you say they're directionally handicapped? Because this matter of Jesus going to hell, if you read Luke 16, what does the Bible say about Lazarus? What do the angels do? They carried him. That means he goes up. <laughs> Is he... Are they going to, like, Abraham's bosom? And by the way, here's the things I had to think about. I'm serious. These are the things I had to think of. These are the things that I went over in my mind. Where was Abraham before Abraham's bosom? Or where were the people before Abraham in Abraham's bosom? What do they call it? What do they, what do they name it? Was it Adam's bosom and then he just got, like, debunked or something? Like, you got to step down, man, because you, you blew up. You messed up. You know what I mean? Just Adam's bosom. Where, where was everyone else before that? Okay. And they're directionally challenged because they're carrying him. The angels carried him, the Bible says. But yet, you know, you got to go. I mean, the rich man didn't have to be carried. He, he just opened his eyes in hell. So, what was I talking about? Oh, King James, okay. So, in order, this is essential because I remember when I came to the crossroads, and in fact... I had a conversation with Pastor Anderson the day we, we decided, he decided to start the church. He asked me, he said, is there anything you don't agree with me? Now, by the way, this is during the time, the whole Tyler Baker, you know, uh, him and his false doctrine, the heretic, when he got kicked out. So obviously this is on his mind. 
Now, Pastor Ernest has known me, and we've talked about doctrine, so he knows where I stand on a lot of things. But he sincerely asked me, he said, is there anything you don't agree with me on in doctrine? And I said, there was one thing, I said, but I already got it taken care of. It was this fact of Jesus going to hell. And I told him, I said, I believe he went to hell. Okay? And this is the reason why, X, Y, and Z, I told him. And I said, look, and I think it, the, the quintessential, essential aspect of why I believe this is because I'm King James only. And I've always had this philosophy, if it's in the King James Bible, I believe it. Right. Okay? And that shows how unique our Bible is. Amen. Okay? Look, I remember someone said, you know, you can't be Baptist and not believe that the Jews are God's chosen people. Okay? Yeah, you could be a heretic Baptist if you want. Right. You know? I mean, he said that, right? The guy said, he goes, you can't be Baptist and I believe that the, 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 the Jews are not God's chosen people. But here's the thing. You can't prove that the Jews are God's chosen people using the King James Bible. Amen. You can prove it all day long using the NIV. Where instead of seed, it says descendants. Right? And in fact, I brought that up to someone and they just kind of tiptoed around it. I mean, they, they do what they do all the time, right? They just kind of like veer off into another subject instead because they, they don't know how to deal with that. Amen. Okay? But this is the same thing with Jesus going to hell. Look, it says hell. You know, Abraham's bosom, you say, well, you know, this, doesn't Acts chapter 16 say, talk about Abraham's bosom? Bosom's right here. Okay. And by the way, Mark, come up here real quick. And it, it says that he was comforted. You know how to comfort someone? Come here, Mark. Let's say Mark, you know, went through something. He's just like, I'm comforting him, right? He's in my book. Okay, you're too tall for this. <laughs> Gotta sit down. He comforted me more than I comforted him. But that's how you comfort someone, right? You put them in your bosom. So obviously, Lazarus experienced evil all his life. Well, guess the reward he gets? He gets to hang out with Abraham. He carried into the bosom of Abraham. So basically, when they carried him into heaven with Abraham, Abraham was already waiting for him to get there. Lands, and he's just like, you're right here with me. We're in heaven now, okay? Everything's all good. Beautiful picture, by the way, right? And the Bible talks about a great gulf fix, okay? Gulf fix is, we're here. This is the great gulf fix right here, Amen. okay? And it's not, and here's the thing, they'll, they'll often tell you, and I used to make this argument too, but I couldn't back it up until I was challenged on this. It's like, well, I need to, I need to read this, about this. I need to study the Bible on this because I don't want to be wrong. I, I love the Lord. I love the Bible, and I want to make sure that I'm right on this. And guess what? I was wrong on it, okay? And I remember I, I studied it out, and I was thinking to myself, wait a minute. Where does it say in the Bible that there's a compartment? <laughs> I'm like, the Bible doesn't even say that. That's weird. A compartment? Now, if you study this doctrine of, of Abraham's bosom or, or paradise, right, what they like to call it, is that they say that the righteous dead are waiting there for judgment. Now, there's a ton of things wrong with that. First of all, righteous are not dead. Even though they die physically, the Bible says that he's the God of the, of the living, not of the dead, right? He's not a God of the, of the dead, but of the living, Amen. all right? So anybody who dies, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Just like the scapegoat was alive before the Lord Amen. when Jesus Christ died. He's alive. Problem number one. Problem number two, we're, they're not awaiting judgment. Amen. Right. Guess where that stems from? Catholicism. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it, Abraham's bosom is the Christianized purgatory. Yeah. Is what it is. Okay? You say, man, that's heresy, man, that Jesus Christ went to hell. Well, look, there's a ton of verses to prove that he is. Amen. But just the simple fact that it pictures it in the Old Testament, that it, the sacrifice was always burned. Yeah. And here's, here's the thing that really kind of caught my attention in regards to this. Where would I have to pay for my sins? Right. If I died, yeah, exactly. I would have to go to hell. Amen. Okay? That's how I would pay for my sins. So therefore, Jesus Christ, in order to pay for our sins, had to go to hell yep. for me. Now look at Acts chapter 2, verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because I will not leave my soul in hell, 
Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with the oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seen this before speak of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. So it clearly says there that his soul was in hell. Yep. It's, 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 it's really Sheol. <laughs> It says hell. Amen. Okay. Now, do you believe that the King James Bible is the inspired and preserved Word of God yes. for the English-speaking people? Yes. yes. If you do, don't go to anything else. Right. And here's the thing. You, to believe these weird doctrines, you have to go somewhere else other yeah. than the King James Bible. Okay. You have to. Did God make a mistake when he put hell? Nope. You know? Did God make a mistake when he said falling away instead of departure? Right. No. It's perfect. Amen. Don't try to fit your, your round peg into your square hole. Yes. Just get the square peg Amen. and accept the fact that he went to hell. Amen. Okay? For us. It's a wonderful picture of it. Every sacrifice was burned. And we could go through tons of scriptures proving that he went to hell. Okay? But just think of the, the logic of the, 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 the directional handicap that these people are. The angels have to carry him down. I mean, this is weird, <laughs> weird stuff. Okay? And here's the thing. If you ever have, if you're, look, I'm saying it publicly. I was wrong about this. Yeah. I was wrong. I'm, I'm fallible. I make mistakes. And I was wrong. I've been a Christian for 11 years, and I was wrong on this doctrine. But you know what? The foundational principle in my life has always been I'm King James only. Yeah. That's why I'm post trip. That's why I'm replacement theology. That's why I hate the homos. Why? Because I'm King James only. Okay? And you can, uh, see, he said he was wrong. Yeah, but you know what? I'm right now. And I'm King James only. Okay? And that's the only way you're going to get these, these, these doctrines. All right? So what's the, what's the sermon today? It's on King James Bible. Amen? No, the sermon is simply this. Man, let's appreciate what Jesus Christ did for us. He pictures beautifully. And we could have gone through so many more symbolism in the Old Testament of Christ regarding the, the, the lamb, the bullocks, and the rams. But these are some beautiful pictures. He provided a covering. He was without blemish. He was the scapegoat. He took our blame. He shed his blood. He gave of his flesh. And he was willing to burn in hell for us for three days and three nights to pay for our sins. Thank God for your salvation today. Amen? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much. For the Lamb of God who should take away the sins of the world. Thank you, Lord, for, for sacrificing yourself for us. And we're thankful for so, many, so much symbolism in the Old Testament that uh, makes, gives us goosebumps. It makes the hairs on our arms stand up when we read and think that that's what the Lord did for us. And how you're willing to emphasize that within the Old Testament. Obviously, it was important to you. And may we never forget you know, the, the fact that, that Jesus Christ did go to hell. He, he was, I mean, a minute in hell, I'm sure, is, is terrible. Three days and three nights is even more. And I'm sure it felt like an eternity. And, and we're thankful for the salvation that we have in Christ. Thank you for the remission of sin and the atonement that we receive through His blood. Help us today, Lord, to be witnesses of this salvation as we go out and preach the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.